Life by Divine with Sue Tomei fosters deep healing and profound awakenings as she guides you to hear, answer, and trust the highest calling of your heart. Your host and sacred guide is global impact visionary leader Sue Demay, a best-selling author, international speaker, and gifted intuitive healer who challenges all of us to shift from life by default or even life by design to truly living life by divine. And now, here is Sue Demay. Welcome to the show. I'm excited to be here with you again this week. And I, I feel like I have so much to share. <laughs> I only have an hour. And, and although in one way it feels like it's a lot to fill, but in another way I feel like I could speak for years with everybody with all the messages that are just pouring through me right now. So I'm honored to be here with you. I'm excited to share the topic today. And it's, it's one of those topics, although I, I'm, to be completely honest, I have a lot of resistance speaking about. So not everything I get, not all the downloads and informations and visions I get is easy to talk about. And for me, it's, it's really about healing my own leftovers as I'm doing my work in the world and using my life as a classroom for my healing. So this radio show is just one other aspect of my classroom for my own healing so this morning when the topic yesterday when the topic came in to talk about today i felt really clear i was really excited and then this morning when i woke up i felt really resistant and i could feel this like this i was bumping up against some leftovers for me and the leftovers are really just fear of judgment fear of people not getting it fear of people you know having their own opinions and stuff and it's all that's what happens every day in life anyway. So, you know, for me to fear, it doesn't make sense anymore. It kept me from actually sharing in the past. It kept me quiet. It kept me silent. It kept me hiding for a long, long time. And, and I hid from my gift and I hid from these visions and really tried to, to, I said no to them. Most of my life, I said no to my gift. And I said no to the visions because it was overwhelming. It was it felt like a curse. I, I didn't understand it. And it wasn't until I actually turned and started to say yes to it and really embody that heart yes energy toward it that everything started to shift. And I started to come to this place where it was more water off a duck's back. I didn't, it didn't matter to me as much what other people were thinking about what I was saying. It felt more important to share the message. And, and I know that a lot of us are feeling a real deep calling to stand up, to stand out and stand strong right now. And I know many of us are feeling a calling to, to shift gears, to step up on stages, to sing that song, to write that book, to be the, the vehicle for the message that's meant to come through you, however it is meant to be expressed. And there's many different ways to express it. Even artwork can be an expression. I met this woman on the weekend who had said, oh, I, I had this spiritual awakening like 16 months ago. I just, I woke up. My mother passed away and something shifted and all of a sudden I woke up and, and she started painting. She's never painted before in her life and she was just painting. She found herself just naturally inspired to paint. Now her mother was a painter, so I think part of it, she was channeling kind of her mother's energy and, and that, that gift that came through her. However, it just... It, it totally changed her life. She, she took some energy healing courses, some Reiki, and she started to infuse the paintings that she was making with energy. And she's just really on this completely different path than before. And I was really drawn to her artwork because I could feel the inspiration of the work. I could feel her heart. I could feel the love. And I could feel her as that vessel and that channel when she was painting. Now, when she's not painting, she was doing her work and, you know, clearing her mind and, and kind of waking up to this whole new way of being in life. When she was painting, she was just a clear vessel for the message to come through, through the paintbrush onto the canvas. And they're beautiful paintings. I'm going to get at least one or two of them. Uh, I'm going to be in touch with her soon. So, but it was beautiful to see the, the, the examples of awakening that's happening right now on our planet. And for those that are resisting the shift, 
and they're fighting it. There's, there's a lot of pain and suffering that happens in that. And because the shift and the calling is actually non-negotiable, we all need to step up and actually create that shift and allow that shift to happen within ourselves so that we can contribute to the healing of the whole. There's still parts of us that resist it. So for example, me, I felt resistant this morning. And the beautiful thing about doing a live radio show is I have to show up. So I, can, I couldn't just all oh, just do it, I'll do it, I'll record it tomorrow or I'll record it later this afternoon. I had to show up. So what I ended up doing was taking my time to meditate and to feel the resistance fully, to tune into it, to sit down beside it, get right inside it and, and feel it fully and be willing to express it and let it move. Because the energy that resistance holds is just a density. And if we can actually soften around the density and create space and be a witness to it, quite often it can move. And then there's other times where we have these layers of resistance or we feel this fear. And the only way to overcome or to heal that fear is to face it fully and move through it directly. And sometimes that means taking action in spite of the fear being present. Now, I was able to actually clear it, most of it, before I came on live with you now. However, I can still feel parts of it bubbling up as I approach the topic that we're going to talk about today, which is healing the collective wounds of humanity in order for all of us to return to love. Now, this is a topic that has come in. I've, I've been triggered by kind of watching different things going on in the world in the last year or two. And I, I had a really hard time watching the news, but yet I was drawn to watch certain things. I don't dwell on the news and, and expose myself too much, but I, but I do feel like feeling that I need to be informed and I need to stay informed about what's going on so that I can actually use it for my healing, but also to support others. So as I was looking at all these different things that were going on in the world, and I was really triggered by different, different ideas and, and concepts that were coming forth and, and topics that people were expressing. And I really needed to find another way to look at it. And so I prayed for another way. I'm like, show me another perspective because the perspective I'm holding and the judgments I'm holding on how things are playing out in the world is painful and uncomfortable. When we look at our collective wounds, it's a little challenging. So we have our own personal wounds and then we have our collective wounds. And what I'm going to share with you today is a, a bigger perspective of what's happening in the world so that on a human level, on our human perspective, we can make peace and accept knowing that there's actually a grand plan, there's something bigger playing out, and we can embrace how it's playing out so that knowing that we're actually leading to something more. So on the weekend, I'm just going to share a little bit. So I went to this festival and I was speaking at, at the festival and then I did a healing circle. And when we first, when I first walked on the land, it, it was an area I hadn't been to before and uh, a park I hadn't been to before. It was an outdoor event. It was a festival for light workers and healers. And I walked onto the land. And I was like, wow, this, this land is really beautiful. It has a lot of history. I could feel a lot of spirits and souls and energy, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't, I didn't know the history of the land. When they started the opening ceremonies, they had some uh, native locals, and the they were singing their 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 in their native tongue and opening the ceremony on these sacred grounds, this sacred native land. And I found out very quickly that it was an old, it was a location of a, a residential school, one of the residential schools. The curious thing about residential schools. I'm just going to jump in here for just go on a sideline here for a really quick moment is I never knew growing up that there was any such thing as a resi residential school. Yeah, I live I grew up in Ontario and Ontario in Canada, the province of Ontario and no one talked about residential schools. I hadn't heard about a residential school until I moved out to BC, British Columbia, which is the west coast of Canada. And they, I started to hear about these residential schools where they basically went in and took these children, indigenous children, native Indian children, and 
took them away from their parents and placed them in these residential schools. They were intended to remove all of the programming and all of the traditions and everything out of out of basically to kind of take these children out of of their environment and their background and make them white basically make them be like white people and i think most of the residential schools were were catholic i'm not positive but i don't know too much of the history but this is this is my what i know and forgive me if i'm getting some of the story wrong when I was hearing about the residential schools while I was standing on the land and they were sharing the, the little bit of the history, I could feel the intensity, I could feel the wounds, I could feel the hurt, I could feel the anger, I can feel some resentment, I could feel the guilt, I could feel the shame. I could feel a lot. So as an intuitive healer, I'm my, one of my gifts is to be able to pick up on a lot of energies and a lot of emotions and a lot of physical things that are going on around me in my environment and in around individuals. And I could feel a lot. I felt very emotional when they were doing the opening ceremonies. And at the same time, I could feel a potential for healing. I could feel a potential for forgiveness. I could feel the potential for love. So when it comes to our collective wounds, what happens is we have these groups that come together and unite and they're standing strong and united. And as one group comes together, another group is triggered. So for example, if we use the indigenous people, these beautiful people, who were taken from, well, their lands were taken from them, taken from their families and placed in these schools. And everything they knew was trying to be removed. Kind of wipe the slate clean and start fresh with a new way of being in life. And I, I can't imagine how that would have felt. And I can only, you know, connect with them at that soul level and, and feel into what they were feeling. And it was traumatic. Traumatic to say the least. Or I'm getting a tickle in my throat, which is part of resistance probably, because I'm talking about this topic. <coughs> so part of me doesn't want to get it wrong. Part of me doesn't want to, to um, say it wrong, do it wrong, do, um, you know, say something that would offend or hurt somebody. And that's not my intention. My intention is just to share from my perspective. I'm no expert in this field. However, I do feel like the perspective I've been given, it will be helpful for everyone. So bear with me as I kind of find my way through the story. I could feel the wounds of the indigenous people, the ones that were there, those that were there, and those that were there in spirit, have, have passed on and remain in spirit. And, and, and just the collective of all, everywhere, all together, all at once. So as women and men unite, as the indigenous unite, it triggers the collective wound for others. And in the beginning, that looks a bit like separation. So we have these beautiful people coming together, standing up, standing out, standing strong, feeling strength in, in sharing their voice and speaking their truth and telling their stories. Their stories are very important and we need to hear those stories. And then as a white woman, <coughs> I would feel the collective shame and guilt for all of the ex experiences and, and the, the trauma we caused as white people. So I have my own triggers, which I've processed. I've cleared that and I've, I've kind of worked through my own stuff around 
racism, inherited racism, stuff like that. And then there is the collective wounds. The collective wound is all white people everywhere. And the collective wound is all indigenous people everywhere. And the collective wound is all black people everywhere and other people of color in all ethnic backgrounds. So we all have our own collective wounds. We can have a collective wound for one country. We can have a collective wound for our ethnic backgrounds. We can have a collective wound for, you know, a school or a, an experience we had in an environment, in a specific environment. Those wounds all need to rise up for healing. If they don't rise up, they remain hidden. And if they remain hidden, then we are triggered and we are, it, it impacts how we behave, it impacts how we react to other people, how we respond to other people, and it, it, it ends up being a block to love. The invitation is to look at your own personal wounds and process them, and to process your collective wounds as well. Let the collective wounds process through you as well. When we look at, <clears throat> I want to talk about a little bit about the experience I had. So when I was doing the healing circle, one of the, the individuals in the healing circle was a young man who was one of the children at the residential school at that location. And all of his wounds were rising up for his own healing. And there was a huge amount of collective wounds that were rising up for all his relatives and generations and ancestors. And what I was able to do was invite that collective energy to rise in the center of the circle as opposed to move, moving and being processed through his physical body. And the, the same thing with, with, with all the others in the group, there's a real collective energy rising up so you may wake up one morning and feel guilty and not sure why you feel guilty. It could be a collective energy of guilt washing through. And if you're a light worker in the world, then all light workers are being used right now to move collective energy. And the collective wounds and the collective energy needs to rise up somewhere and it's it's channeling through light workers right now. So as a light worker, I will feel that collective energy and then move it just outside of my body and allow it to move up into of an energy vortex and an energy field that I use for healing. That allows me to move that energy for others and for myself without feeling the density of it moving up and through my body. Interestingly, we need to allow our personal wounds at the same time to be cleared and healed. And the more we can clear our personal wounds, the more of a clear channel we can, come, we can become for the collective ones. Some of you are going to understand this, some of you are not. So for some of you, this is a little bit like a stretch for the mind. And for others, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. And or it's going to bring you peace and then you're going to have some understanding and it's going to be really helpful for you. So it may resonate on a very deep level or you might resist it or you might just not totally understand it at all. And that's okay. When I first started feeling this energy and trying to, trying to map it out myself, it was actually when I was hearing words, you know, articles or people talking about racism and white privilege. And every time someone would talk about white privilege, I would feel defensive. And I would kind of not shut down. I, did, I didn't want to talk about it. I would avoid it. I didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to me. Other people would talk about it as, as reverse racism. So it, it really just, what it felt like was separation. And I teach about oneness. I teach about uniting in love. I teach about coming together. And, and, and those words were creating a feeling of separation. I didn't understand that. I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. So that's where I was praying for a different perspective, a different way of looking at it. And the piece I saw was that initially as we unite and stand up and stand out and stand strong together there's these pockets of unification that happen 
So there's more black women standing together and speaking their truth and, and having a voice. And there's women as a collective, all of women standing together with the Me Too campaign. That's an example of women standing together and uniting and having a voice and, and basically standing up and saying it's not okay. And, and you know, feeling like empowered again, having that, that sense of, of feeling empowered. It's in these pockets of unification that we can feel empowered. But if one, as one group comes together, so as women are joining together with the Me Too campaign, there's men that are triggered and feeling guilty and shameful because the collective guilt is rising up in them. The collective wound is being triggered in them. As black women are coming together, white women may be triggered and, and that, that collective wound is rising up in them. Now, the challenge is, on a surface level, this looks like separation. And it's, it's even more challenging because, especially for those that are teaching oneness or, or you know, making a conscious choice for love, how is that a choice for love? It is. A choice for love is to honor the wounds in others and witness them and celebrate them standing up and standing out and unifying in love for them. For, for each other. And it does feel a little bit like a certain group of people or another group of people may be left out where there's a separation. But again, it's only on the surface level, it's only on a human level that it looks like separation. There's these pockets of unification happening. And they have to happen because as one group unifies, another's triggered and that wound comes to the surface for healing. If it doesn't come to the surface, it remains hidden. So these pockets of unification are a gift. And if, if you're triggered by a group coming together and having a voice and standing strong in that voice and standing united in that voice, then your work is not to challenge what they're doing or to take away from what they're doing, but to honor their unification and look at your own triggers. When we look at our own triggers, we are actually freeing everyone when we do our own healing. So we are always contributing to the healing of the whole. When we're willing to look within and do our own healing, we're always contributing to the healing of the whole. So here we are in this beautiful opportunity and on a surface level, it looks like separation, but on a grand scale on a bird's eye view on a spiritual perspective it's these pockets of unification happening we haven't had this before we haven't had these pockets of unification happening in the way they are today and we haven't had these pockets of unification happening in a way that actually empowers a group and triggers another and at the same time uh, there's an invitation for healing for that group now, it's a bit of a domino effect, and the more we can honor our own process, feel our own feelings, process our own triggers, let the guilt wash up within us, let the shame wash up within us, let the rage, the resentment, the anger, whatever it is for each group that's a little different, and for each situation that's a little different, then there's actually room for forgiveness, then there's room for a global unification. It has to be in pockets first. Then we can all come together. Again, this is a little challenging to wrap the mind around. My intention is to give you some pieces and a perspective that will help you begin to move through your own process around it so that you can begin to contribute to the healing of the whole. And instead of adding to fear to the fear that's already there, instead of adding resistance to the resistance that many people are feeling, we can begin to actually be the channel when we clear everything that's interfering or blocking us from being in alignment with love.
So we're going to take a short break. And as I do, I'm going to invite you to just sit with what I'm, what you've heard so far, see what resonates, see where you feel resistant, see where you feel triggered. And the invitation through the break is to feel into that feeling of trigger and see what happens. Just create some space for it. Let it imagine softening around it. Imagine the energy moving up or moving down, whichever way it wants to move. It needs an expression and it needs some space to move. Now, if you have kind of a feeling of a collective energy or collective wound washing up, just imagine you could place it just in front of you in a beautiful vortex of energy and that would take it up and away and help it heal. It's a bit of a stretchy conversation, I know, and I know you, you don't know me all that well yet. Some of you are new to me. However, I really felt it was important to give this perspective at this time because I think a lot of people are really struggling and really confused by what's going on in the world. So as we shift our awareness and open our minds to another perspective, we can actually soften our hearts and allow the healing and the forgiveness and the unification to happen for all of us, everywhere, all together, all at once. You're listening to Life by Divine. My name is Sue Jemay, and we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. Are you looking for a career that will make your heart sing? Do you feel deeply and easily discern others' needs, hidden hurts, emotions, and blind spots? And you want to use your intuitive gift to guide others to greater success and faster healing? Sue Dumais' 10-month intuitive coaching certification program will help you become a clear channel for healing energy and intuitive insights. This program is designed for those who feel a deep calling to do their own heart work while learning to inspire and guide others to do the same. Our once-a-year enrollment is now open with a limited number of spots available for our October 2nd start date. Apply today at heartledliving.com slash become a coach. Welcome back. You're listening to Life by Divine, and I'm your host, Sue Jumay. If you're just joining us, we've been talking about how to heal our collective wounds of humanity so that we can all return to love. And I've been talking about some sensitive topics and topics that I'm, I, I still tiptoe around a little bit myself. So, you know, giving myself some permission to get it wrong giving myself permission to, to you maybe use the wrong word here or there, or the wrong term here and there. And at the same time, I'm wide open to feedback and I'm, I'm wide open. This is my classroom for healing. This is my classroom for learning. I'm always a student first. So if there's another way I can say something, if there's a, a word that I could use instead, I'm open to that feedback. I'm open to hearing from you. And for me, it's, it's about... I can't wait until I got the me I get the message perfectly to say this because I really feel it's important right now to share this message to empower each of us to see another perspective. And as we're feeling that 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 separation on a human level, we feel these pockets of unification happening all around us. We're triggered in our own leftovers and our own stuff and then the collective stuff for, for our particular race or for our particular background or country, we can, we can actually feel more like we actually have a sense of hope, that there is a bigger picture playing out, that there, there is a bigger plan playing out. Then it becomes a part, the question is really becoming, what is my part? What role am I meant to play? So when this first started to come in and, and I started to kind of feel the, the impact of the talk, talks about racism and white privilege, I, as a white woman, I was very triggered by it. And at the same time, I was really triggered by people that are racist. And I had this, I watched this one video. I couldn't watch the whole thing, but this video came out of a white, and some of you might have seen it, but it was a, a white Canadian woman who was in the restaurant. I don't know the circumstances that happened before. I don't know what set her off, but she was set off. And what happened was she was 
loud, <laughs> obnoxious, and very bluntly racist. So her her language was really sharp and, and hurtful, and it was really painful for me to watch. And every time she stood up, all proud, saying, "I'm a white, I'm a Canadian woman," I was like, like I just felt everything inside of me contract. Every time she said it, she said it more than once. As a Canadian woman, I, you know, like, go back to your own country. Like whatever she was saying, I was like, every time she said Canadian woman, I contracted everything inside of me, like wanted to stop breathing. After I watched the video and I was processing my trigger, I realized that I felt guilty by association because I'm a white Canadian woman. And I certainly wouldn't see myself ever doing that. But at the same time, I felt guilty by association. So for me to wash that guilt up and create space for that guilt to wash, it took some time. It took a couple of days and it took a couple of conversations with people that I trust and that could really listen to how I was feeling without judging me further. It took a while for me to process that. And at the same time, I, I wanted to do something. I felt like I felt compelled to say something or do something like, how can I just stand back and let this happen? And I know it's, it's not just an isolated incident. You know, as much as I'd like to believe that Canada is not racist, we, we certainly have a lot of racist people. I, I, I can imagine that. But I also started to recognize that there's inherited racism that we all have in our own ways. So I started to look at, well, how am I racist? I, I'm obviously triggered by other people that are outwardly racist, but how am I, you know, inwardly racist? How am I programmed to be racist? And that opened up a whole other can of worms. Now, I wasn't raised in a family with, with outward racist behavior. That wasn't the way I was brought up. But I certainly was exposed to it in our society. I've certainly had experiences where I saw it going on in the world. And with me growing up with really low self-esteem, I'm, I'm sure I contributed somehow along the way. And... I'm probably still in some way contributing without realizing it. So again, I go back to recognizing I'm a student first. I'm willing to learn. I'm open to hearing, you know, what I need to do or what I need to shift or change in order to unwind and unprogram my own race, racist inheritance. When we look at our own triggers and we're willing to go within and feel what we need to feel in order to heal what we need to heal, that's a, that's a beautiful first step. When we have an open mind and when we're willing to be a student first, then that is another step, a beautiful step toward healing and toward shifting how things have been done in this world. When we're willing to look at what is my part, my first year part is to heal. First year part is to look at your own triggers. That's the first step. Then then the step is, is there something you're meant to do in the world? Are, are you meant to say something? Are you meant to write an article? Are you meant to write a book? Are you meant to have a voice in some way? Or, you know, are, are you meant to share an article or a blog of somebody else? Are you meant to help spread the word? There is a part that each of us play. And the part is a little bit unique to each of us, although it might look similar to what other people are doing. We each have a unique part, an essential part to play in the healing of the whole. And sometimes it looks like taking on sensitive topics. Sometimes it looks like rocking the boat. Sometimes it, it means making other people uncomfortable and triggering, triggering other people. So chances are this episode has triggered some people and will trigger some people. But I know that the triggers are helpful in helping us heal what's hidden and what's underneath. So if my topic today has triggered you or makes you feel uncomfortable or makes you just want to avoid or get off and kind of close, close your computer and, and stop listening, then chances are there's something for you to look at. Your willingness to look within is essential. Because as long as things remain hidden within each of us, they can't heal for the collective. Then we can look at the collective wounds at the same time. 
So this isn't a linear process. So we're going to heal ourselves. We're going to maybe speak up about some things. Maybe we're going to take a stand if we see something. Maybe we're riding on transit and we see someone being racist or, or attacking someone else because of, of their the color of their skin or their, their background. Say something. Maybe you're inspired to stand up and say something. Maybe you'll be inspired to stand up and, and tell them, no, it's not okay. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying we, we have to all do that in the world, but I definitely feel that there's probably more of us being called to do that. And if you feel it inside of you, if you feel something inside of you standing up and saying, no, it's not okay, you need to stop, I would encourage you to follow that, to feel that, that, that force within you that's guiding you into action, that's inspired action. We need more people taking inspired action. We need more voices of truth. We need more voices of hope. We need more voices that are standing up and saying no because every time we say no we're actually saying yes to something else so when if i were to stand up and say no to someone who's being racist what i'm saying yes to is unification oneness what i'm saying yes to is love love doesn't always sound kind it doesn't always sound soft and it doesn't always sound compassionate a choice for love can be a really strong no, it's not okay. That's what the Me Too campaign is all about. Women standing up and saying, no, not anymore. Not anymore, it's not okay. And we put up with it for a long time, but not, not anymore. So there, there's becoming a bit of a zero tolerance to mm, sexual comments, harassment, abuse, all of that, it's becoming a zero tolerance and there's more women standing united against it. And it looks like we're standing against, but really we're standing for, what we're standing up for is, is love, love for self, respect, our self-esteem, our worthiness, all of that. We're standing up for a lot. The Me Too campaign is, there's a lot in that. But there's a lot in a lot of the campaigns that are coming that are bringing us together and unifying these beautiful groups. When we stand united, we feel stronger. But at first, we sometimes need to stand up inside of ourselves. And that takes a lot of courage. It takes less courage to stand with others. So standing with others is great. And then in that, can you stand up inside yourself? How can you stand up inside yourself? I remember watching Marianne Williamson on stage, and she did this a couple times when I saw her speak live at an event where she was talking about the, like, standing up for something, to, you know, against, like, saying no to something, basically. And she's like, how do you, someone had asked the question, how do you, you know, return to love? How do you respond with love when, say, say someone tries to break into your home and, and take your child because there was a, uh, an experience someone was talking about that. And she's like, you know, a choice for love doesn't mean you let people do whatever they want. A choice for love is sometimes you standing up and saying, no, not in my house. It is not welcome here. You are not welcome here. I can see everyone as capable of healing. I can see everyone has healed. I, I see it. I can, I can see that. I have that vision for, I can see past all of the behaviors. I can see past all of the fear. I can see past everything and see the healed part of their spirit. I can see the truth of who they really are behind all of these things and, and they're healed and whole and, whole and complete. At the same time, I will not let that in my house. There's certain boundaries that I place. I can forgive, but it doesn't mean I let them in my home. I can see them as capable and healed and whole. And at the same time, I can see their ego and the, the, the part that it's playing. It doesn't mean I put up with things. Being loving, being spiritual, 
being compassionate doesn't mean we put up with certain behaviors. So I give you permission to say no. I give you full permission to stand up inside of yourself and say no. I give you full permission to say that's not okay. What you're doing is not okay. Now you may be standing up for yourself. You may be standing up for another. Sometimes it's easier to stand up for somebody else. Sometimes it's easier to stand up for ourselves. For some people, it's actually painful to do either. So begin where you can. Start where you can. Just begin. Just start. We won't get anywhere unless people are willing to take the first step. So the topic today, again, a little bit of a sensitive topic, healing the collective wounds of humanity to return to love is an essential one. We need to talk more about this. We need to express more about this. We need to create an understanding so that people can understand and begin to shift toward love, knowing that it's going to look a little ugly. It's going to get a little icky. It's not going to be comfortable. And I know, I can feel and sense all the women that are standing up for the Me Too campaign it's not easy for them to take that stand. It's not easy for them to come forward and say, this happened to me, and, and there's, there's a lot of shame and guilt around that. There's a lot of wounds around that. There's a lot of fear around that. But you've noticed now, the more women who do it, the more empowered other women feel to do it for themselves as well. So sometimes it just takes one to start the domino, to start the domino effect and, and then everybody starts to come out of the woodwork and that's exactly what's happening right now. Eventually, and I talk about this in my new book, Stand Up, Stand Out, Stand Strong, a 30-day guide to navigate life when the shift hits the fan. Eventually what needs to happen is we need to forgive. But in order to get to a place of forgiveness, we need to first stand up inside of ourselves. We need to feel like we're, we're taking our power back and we feel empowered. At the same time, we know that we're causing the wound for another to rise up. And at the same time, we're rising the collective wound for that, for that group of people. In this case, it's men and women. And I know there's some really beautiful men out there. I know there's men out there that, that, that are wanting to do right that are wanting to stand with women and unite with them and, and let them know that they're there to support them. And in some ways, you're going to be able to do that. In other ways, you're not because it's, it's the collective wound of women that's healing, that's rising. And the collective wound of men is being triggered. So in some ways, men can stand with us. In other ways, they can't. The same way I can stand beside a black woman and support her, but I can't fully understand what she has gone through and what she continues to go through. I can stand beside her and honor her and celebrate her and cheer her on, but I can't stand united with her because I'm not a black woman. As the wounds clear, as the healing happening happens, then we can stand united. Then we can all unite, all of us, all of humanity, everywhere, all together, all at once. Not one person will be left out of that beautiful bubble of unification. All of us will come together eventually. But right now we need to honor the pockets of unification that are happening and see them as necessary, see them as the gifts that they are, and allow space for the expression and the release and the healing of all the, the wounds. It's really essential. It's the only way. We can't bypass this. We can't, we can't bypass the wounds and, and because that's what we've been doing. And it doesn't work. We've been doing that for a long time. Burying the wounds, keeping them hidden in the closet, doesn't work. 
Everything needs to come to the surface for healing. Everything needs to be felt. All the emotions that are left over, all the tears that haven't been cried need to be cried. All the pain that hasn't been felt needs to be felt. It doesn't need to be as painful as the way it went in. That's the good news, is we can actually move through these wounds a little quicker because there's actually a lot of energy to support us. What used to take one healer to do, what, what used to take 10 healers to do, one healer can do now. What used to take months or, or years to clear and heal, we can do in an hour or a day. That's the, the global shift is actually supporting us. Although it's intense and it's in our face and if we're resisting, it's really hard to, to manage. But when we surrender to it and we allow and we're willing to receive and we're willing to release and feel and heal, then we actually shift into this beautiful alignment that allows healing to happen with, with more of a quick and quick and pace. And there's a lot more support. There's a recognition that vulnerability is a strength. More and more people are willing to be vulnerable and in that vulnerability, we're actually empowering others to be vulnerable, to express their wounds and to share their experiences. And as they do, others feel empowered to do the same. This is how we feel. This is how we heal collectively. Yes, it looks individual. Yes, it looks like pockets of unification that on a surface level look like separation. But ultimately, it's all leading to the same place, which is global unification. All of us uniting in love for each other and our planet. When we look at people's roles, and some people have a different role to play. Some people may have a, the appearance of a bigger role. Some people may have the appearance of a smaller role, but everybody's role is essential. Everybody plays a part. All the parts contribute to the healing of the whole. Every part, everyone's role, including yours. If we all said yes to playing our part, and we all were willing to take the steps to move in the direction of the healing of the whole, then we would actually arrive quicker to that outcome. The challenge is there's a lot of people still living life by default. I talked about this in earlier episodes, in the first and second episode, and talk about the life by default, life by design, and life by divine. What we're all being called to move toward is life by divine. Life by default is to sleep at the wheel, resisting everything that's happening, resisting feeling what needs to be felt. Everything is in our face, but we're ignoring it. 80% of the population is still living life by default. Everybody's being called to awaken. The challenge is some people that are living life by design are being called to shift into life by divine, which is totally surrendering and allowing the divine to work through them in every way. So it's a stage where we can embody our humanness and embody our divinity at the same time and allow the divine to work through us as these human beings on this earth walking in these earth suits. There's a reason you are who you are. There's a reason you look the way you look. There's a reason you sound the way you sound. Because you are a unique messenger for the message of love. You are a unique messenger that is here to play an essential role. Will you say yes to play your role? Will, will you say yes to play your part in the healing of the whole? Now, life by design is where we think we know what we need to do 
and we're still kind of in between the head and the heart and we're trying to navigate it with our head thinking that we know what what needs to happen and the only reason I get these visions and get these perspectives is because I let go of my need to know and my need to understand and I I drop into the I, I know nothing about anything I drop into the idea that I know nothing about anything and in that space of nothingness in my mind I open up to everything in my heart I open up to a wisdom that goes beyond whatever I can make up in my head I tap into a wisdom that goes beyond the influence of my ego mind the influence of fear now I still have a human experience of fear I still have my human experience of resistance as I explained earlier however I make a conscious choice over and over again to really let my heart lead to let the divine lead the way in my life and I surrender my personal agenda over and over again and in certain ways it's really easy in other ways it's challenging I invite you to shift into living life by divine it might take some time and you might feel it's it's a bit of a daunting task or a, a travel and kind of a uphill battle but I promise you as you get beyond the restrictions of the physical mind the programming in the physical mind as we begin to unwind and unprogram and unlearn all of our limitations we'll actually see that there is this beautiful guidance that comes in and directs our every move in every moment every step of the way everything is given when it comes to healing the wounds of humanity on a human level we don't know how to do it but on a soul level we absolutely do we absolutely do surrender the hum human kind of limitations surrender the human mind and align with your heart and let your heart lead let the divine work through you it's an it's a beautiful bridge from your heart to the divine and the guidance will come in moment to moment and you will discover what your role is and your willingness to say yes yes I'm willing to play my part yes I'm willing to see what I need to see feel what I need to feel do what I'm meant to do and be how I, who I'm meant to be in this world knowing that it contributes to the healing of others your part is essential and you need to say yes to it so even in this moment maybe you feel like yes maybe you're like I'm not too sure maybe you need to listen to this episode again either way just know that the energy of yes within your heart has infinite potential when you say yes to the divine when you say yes to spirit to God to source to the universe we are then working on a global level on a higher perspective the highest perspective you could ever imagine in contributing to the healing of all of humanity and our planet that's what we're going for here that's what we're all being called to do is to embody our humanness embody your divinity and say yes are you willing to play your part are you willing to let your heart lead you are you willing to let your heart jump into the driver's seat and your mind take the passenger seat the way it was designed are you willing to say yes just say yes see what happens the side effect in my experience is miracles you've been listening to life by divine and I'm your host Sue May I'm honored to share this platform with you to share my voice and my message at this time I love you I see you I honor you until next week namaste you've been listening
listening to Life by Divine with your host, Sudhane. Shift your consciousness from head to heart and enliven your soul as you discover how to live with your heart and live your own life by divine. Join Sue in the growing global heart Lab living community at heartlabliving.com. That is heart, L-E-D, living.com. 